Coinbase Learn Group, I think we've come a long way from our last crit. Uh, we actually have a system this time around. Last time I think we just presented ideas that we've been uh, throwing up. Um, and uh, what we want to do is go through what we think are like almost three key products um, of our design and then go into what going through our project-based system looks like for um, a student that's going to be going through college for four years. Um, and so our mission is still the same as it was before. We're trying to reimagine the way that Western pedagogy is done by doing learning in a time-efficient and high-impact manner that's combining a lot of disparate knowledge, where right now you may feel like you're learning a whole bunch of different things, but there's no way for it to come together um, and actually form some competencies and produce some employable skills um, through group-based collaborative projects. Um, and with that, we have three main things that we want to go over as our system. The first is a new skills-based core. Uh, the second is going to be inquiry groups that you will be forming with other people or will be formed for you that you will use to progress throughout your four years. Um, and then three is an unlocking mechanism for moving from one year to another where based off of the skills or competencies that you've achieved, and we'll talk about how you measure that, you'll be able to unlock new inquiry groups that you'll be able to join in in your second, third, and fourth year. So the fundamental change is that the current system is centered around classes, and we're decentering classes and focusing on an ecosystem for projects. Mm -hmm. um, and to, to start off with the skills-based core, uh, the problem we realize with the current core is that it's very one-dimensional and teaches, um, it teaches specific subjects, but it doesn't teach you the complex methods or skills that you need to engage in projects. And if we're going to have a project-based learning system, what you really need in the core is a set of skills that will allow you to, to go and address any project that you're trying to uh, work on. And so the first course we wanted in this skills-based core was the nature of project-based learning. How do you go about collaborating? How do you go about deconstructing the system similar to what we did in this class and then reconstructing it with the individual parts? Um, second is information visualization, everything from graphic design to maybe web design. Uh, but in any project that you're engaging in, you're going to have to produce these results and show these results to an audience. Um, and we want that to be a part of the core uh, where you start off your freshman year. Uh, third is going to be language skills. And when we say language, we're not limiting this to uh, you know, spoken languages. This means music, this means computer languages. Um, this also means like French and Spanish and Arabic and all the rest. Uh, but what this skills-based core is, is a framework for students to um, abide by, but they'd be able to spit, kind of decide what their core looks like uh, according to how they want to uh, approach their college career. Um, the fourth one is going to be a computer science uh, skill because we think it's very necessary to a 21st century education. And the fifth one is going to be met research methods because even though you may be working on uh, practical projects that have impact, you're going to want to produce research or there will be a necessity to do research in a certain way, um, and having that skill is going to be necessary for how you progress. And so part of that first year skill-based core is what we call the freshman two. And this is how we organize students in those groups normally. Now, most of the cases will be randomized, which is a put with a group of students. But in some cases, you'll have a set in core inquiry group that will be with you throughout that entirety of that skill-based core as well as another one. So you'll see them repeatedly <laughs> through multiple classes. That's the basis for starting a community of people who might be peers or collaborate or interact with each other. The second one would be less randomized. So it's also a group you're consistently with, but one that might be aligned according to, say, the charm system or some sort of algorithm where in the beginning before starting classes, you're surveyed on what interests you're, you have, and then you're put with a similar group of people that you might share interest in. So for example, while everyone will have to take classes on, say, information visualization, you might be put with people who are more economics or finance focused, who are interested in marketing aspects of information visualization. And therefore, you start the beginnings and seeds of, say, an inquiry group that will be. Then after the first year, you expand into what we are generally calling inquiry groups. Now, inquiry groups are collections of peers, with mentors that aren't focused on, say, receiving a set grade in that class, but it's kind of a hybrid between the class and the extra curricular, in the sense that you don't have firm set obligations to complete tasks you're not interested in, but you're simply put in an environment that regularly meets and regularly interacts and discusses the things that they are working on and things that they might be interested in working on. And the inquiry groups would be based on topics. So 
we have a taxonomy for actually organizing these interest groups. One of them would be structured versus independent. It might start off with very structured inquiry groups you're setting here. And the second taxonomy is broadness or specificity of the topic. So you might start with a very structured economics inquiry group if you're interested in that you're setting. But as later years progress, you might go towards a more specific and independent group. You might write your own thesis about a specific form of economic model in, say, Sub-Saharan Africa. And this would be largely by yourself, with maybe the help from a mentor reviewing your work. So it would be more independent than, say, a more structured class that gives you assignments that you have to regularly complete. And we expect that uh, from your freshman to your second, to your third, and your fourth year, uh, there's going to be a sort of a dashboard system that allows you to see uh, what inquiry groups you're unlocking. And the whole reason we want to do this is, uh, one, we originally had the idea of using points, um, where you'd be able to say maybe you have like 72 computer science points and 52 in information visualization, and as a result of this combination, you've unlocked XYZ inquiry groups. Uh, but then we had some conversations and realized that points are still too reminiscent of the previous system, and we're really not trying to quantify uh, the skills you have, but rather we want a way to express the knowledge, skills, and dispositions that students are learning year after year, and how they're able, and, and as a result, what they're able to focus on in those coming years. Um, and I think we want to stick to this term of unlocking new groups. Um, in the words of Anne, it was emotionally and psychologically delicious uh, <laughs> to want to unlock something in the future, um, which I never thought of, but I think is, you know, in, in a, almost a gaming sense, is very true, where you're unlocking the next level and going into a deeper level of inquiry, uh, whether it be economics or uh, English um, or whatever it is. Um, yeah. uh, so let's take an example. Let's say you have a student named Randy. So <laughs> he'll take a bunch of skill-based core classes, or groups rather, in his first year. Some of them will be randomized groups that will consistently be with. Others will be interest-based. So let's say Randy is interested in education and pedagogy. So some of them will be education where the people who all take computer science classes. Then they'll go into their secondary inquiry groups. Maybe they'll make friends with another person named Anne, and they'll go into the same inquiry group based on, say, uh, university design, focusing on secondary education learning. Like, that will be a model. But there might be, I don't know, a journalism box that's unlocked for him because he might have published an article which unlocks one of the requirements for that inquiry group. And the second requirement for that inquiry group might be something like an experiential internship. So what this does, it gives a path for that man he might follow. On a macro scale, this sort of dashboard allows him to see what inquiry groups are available, what he might be making progress towards but not have yet, has yet unlocked, and some that might have not even been on his radar in the first place, but he's already unlocked and might be interested in doing and expanding his progress. And so in doing so, the dashboard allows you to see what paths you might take, new paths you might take, and the requirements which we have with this blown up box here for what you might have. And while the visualization might be hard to see if you're far, what we've done is highlight certain parts of the box. So in this example box, if Randy has only one of the two components to get into that inquiry group, that box would be partially halfway highlighted. The other half being gray to show him, okay, I've only unlocked half of the requirements. I need to do the other half if I want to get into this. And so, uh, two points that matter along the way. One is, so what happens to classes in this whole system? Uh, we're expecting classes to go away. Uh, what's going to happen is in your second year, so after you finish the core, the only uh, times in which you're learning in a classroom or maybe learning online is going to be in the form of knowledge packets. So say in your second year you've chosen to do these three inquiry groups, and as a result you want to take a course on uh, African history from 1850 to present, uh, and you want to take computer science course on a specific skill. These are what we're calling knowledge packets, where you essentially only learn what you need to know for that project. Um, it would be a lot more decentralized than it is right now, and a lot less structured, but also a lot more flexible for the people involved. Uh, second is, we expect that this system requires a whole lot more professors than the university has right now, because if you are working on an inquiry group that has uh, many different angles in which you're approaching an issue, one of which might, you know, we use this class as an example where you'd want people who are computer scientists, and you'd want education policy people, and you'd want people who understand the you know, formation of pedagogy, those professors will all be mentors, which I think may help kind of be the issue we had with LS, uh, with uh, the comments of this presentation with, what if students don't want mentors? Here we're actually trying to create a learning environment that puts the two together uh, in almost every stage throughout
of graduation. And then the final uh, small point is we want seniors who are in their last year to be involved with teaching the skill base core because they may not realize along the way that there is uh, a new way, a new way in which they apply information visualization or a certain way in which they uh, hacked something or did some problem solving uh, using a coding language that would be very useful for, you know, for them to know as a freshman, but they were never told. And so if you have a sort of a feedback loop where seniors are coming back and helping to teach the skill-based core, uh, you really have a closed loop education system where everything feels like a community. And you can even amplify the feedback loop if you involve alumni and say these other secondary inquiry groups that the student progress. So not only will they have a group of peers and actual or committed mentors, say professors, they also have alumni who have gone through those inquiry groups before and could share what they've done and what they've learned. And finally, after going through the entire process, what's the output? You know, normally we use gray for a graduation requirement, but in this case, since the focus is on projects, the end result would be a portfolio. There's simple uh, checklists or projects that you have to complete. You have to complete at least one written project. We recognize that written projects are important essays, things like that. And they can be completed at any stage of this whole thing. The second might be a requirement for an experiential project. So these different inquiry groups might be, one of them could be an internship-driven experiential group, where you get with a group of people who all want to work on Capitol Hill. Doing that would satisfy your experiential requirement. And finally, there would be a collaborative project requirement, requiring you to do at least one project in this whole educational process with at least another person, teaching you teamwork, and in fact, possibly creating future opportunities to create a portfolio with this person. Now, after creating all your projects, each student should have the opportunity to present their portfolio, the projects they've created throughout this entire thing. At the same time, a collaborative portfolio will allow you to become sort of a package deal with another student. If you build a relationship and then multiple projects or one really big project with someone, it could be easily incorporated to have a portfolio have multiple people. In the same way that you might have a system that shows person A's projects and person B's projects, you could also highlight per the combination of them together. It will be one whole dashboard combining all the problems together. And that kind of goes into our final conversation on the stakeholder outside the university, which is employers. Um, and we had a great conversation with Ann talking about how there are some employers right now that are hiring teams. So if you have a set of, you know, maybe a set of projects in your portfolio or a single project which you do with the team, um, your employer would see that portfolio and maybe see that project and want to hire you as a team and maybe you interview as a team. And that actually makes it a whole lot easier for employers who, instead of going around the country, especially for new grads, and putting them all together in a team, why don't you get people you already know work together and have produced results working together um, and have them work for your company. And one final, uh, I think a question that we're left with uh, for a whole lot, but one of them is, what is the size of this inquiry group? Um, and of course, it depends on the size of the project that they're working on. But we were toying around with the idea of two, just because in a group of two, you don't have equal politics. Uh, they can be very open with each other, and you don't have to worry about the third person, or you know, whatever it may be. There's a lack of people politics there. Uh, and second is that it's small enough where both people can have a significant role, but having someone else to throw ideas off of is one of the most valuable things we are working on. And I think that's What excites you and what you think they should work on? Feel free. Yeah. Um, so I have a question. So why are you sticking with the four year like, college experience? Because it seems like with the idea of projects and like private projects, you could maybe graduate in a shorter amount of time or you could make like, a longer time to produce those requirements. I mean, I think that's a fantastic point. The only reason we did it is that it kind of lets us, I think what we're trying to do <laughs> is find out when do you unlock new inquiry groups. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it makes a whole lot of sense that it might be different now to different people. And actually that's something that we haven't looked into very much at all. Is, does this have to be four years rigid or could it, you know, what do the years mean? Um, mm -hmm. That's just something we haven't looked at at all. Yeah. Uh, I'm an enormous fan of this. I think this is and like I huge love everything. Um, the all the just a couple of comments I've had is that uh, I, I appreciate the thought of tying 
this whole alumni comment, but I don't know how uh, realistic that might be, or even if that's practical in terms of if you had a mentor that isn't a short term alumni, it's certain that you would have them be part of the feedback loop. Uh, and besides that, it's something that we actually discussed in our group. Um, I would like to recommend the idea that the senior feedback loop not be an expectation, but like an honor for that senior, in a sense of like, there are seniors, perhaps like myself, who don't deserve to be the ones like, <laughs> like helping other freshmen. Uh, and, and that like, it, that like it, it should be a, like a big deal that like, if you were given the recognition of being the leader of that, um, that uh, Uh, are the skill-based core classes, like do those get grades if an intro to a computer science class? Is that so product facing that it's, it's like hard to get for? Yeah, for the those course classes, there's no grade for the class. There's only an evaluation of each project you produce in the class. Okay. Go ahead. Um, is there a way for you in like you dramatically change your interests or your focus to like jump from like the top? Yeah, because of the limited space, we couldn't like show what we envision what a real map of the courses would, or groups would be. But some of them probably don't have to have very stringent requirements. Like an upper level writing class doesn't require you to have written, say, a lot of English writing. You could have participated in a lot of different forms of inquiry groups that still would qualify you given the experience for that. And so I think that groups can be pretty flexible with moving between various ends. So you might say, you might emphasize that as like one of the distinct advantages of what you're creating, because it seems to me that could be potentially one of the exciting things about the dashboard that unlocks things that you're like, oh my god, I didn't realize I'd unlock these things that like in the current system, it's like I'm on this major track or that minor track or whatever, but the dashboard system would say, oh my god, like beneath that structural surface, I have like all these things that actually I'm only like these two little tick marks away from actually being able to do this whole cool thing I never would have thought I could do. So if that's one of the things you think is the advantage of the system, is this kind of lateral movement, kind of like you know, what Kelly's like, lateral movement that you wouldn't be able to see otherwise without this data coming in the dashboards, then you should surface that. At what point do you kind of become aware that you're close to unlocking something? Are these all predetermined, or do they happen as people approach kind of similar things together? So if you focus on it in the past, and you have some number of points together, the inquiry groups are partially built off like social clubs, right? So I can imagine. So I mean, a professor could offer one of these, but nobody could be qualified for it yet. Whereas if people are converting at some point, maybe a professor could step up and say, oh, I think I should offer an inquiry group here. But where do you see that coming in the institution? So is the question like about the creation of the groups or about the benchmarks to get into those groups? So, because I think if you have a bunch of people who are Clearly converging on a certain benchmark, then it might be a sign that you should create an inquiry group around that. But also, you should have inquiry groups that are always set up mm -hmm. that people might drift into. I think I think it would be a combination of the two. So some would be preset, and some of the requirements for inquiry groups that we know people would be interesting are preset. But hopefully, this dashboard is smart enough to suggest, well, almost suggest groups of people and topics for inquiry groups. And maybe that's not what ends up happening, but that's a way for that conversation to start. Um, and there also should be a way for professors to be inputting information into this dashboard that says like, these students don't realize it right now, but after they finish this inquiry group or after they finish this project, they may, be work, they may work very well together on this next research question or this next practical initiative. Yes. And I think that system is very open to students getting together to create their own inquiry groups. Mm -hmm. While students in the present system can try to like ask for classes or like, like jumps to a new major, it's very difficult because these classes have to be accredited. They have to give grades. So if inquiry groups aren't giving grades, it makes it more easy for students to create a group and say, well, can we find a professor who can help mentor us in this area? Thank you. Um, since, in a way, it looks like a game, um, or about cheats. Cheats. So, you know, if you have the same game and some people find out a way to a back door or something, I don't know, like, how do you ensure that the process through which people like accumulate knowledge and skills 
happened instead of them figuring out a way to just game the system to get to a certain level they want to. So, or is that like built in as like? We cheat in one way, like cheat as in maybe they skip a new free group or? Or like, because the idea of you getting entrance into the new free group is that you gain sort of sort of expertise in certain things, right? But how do you measure that? And should there's a way to like, oh, pretend that I have expertise in something and get through that. So the way you get into the advanced groups isn't being in necessarily an intermediate group beforehand. The way you get in is by accomplishing or having certain amount of projects on your portfolio that demonstrate that you have the ability to do it. And the secondary part that might mitigate that concern <coughs> is that you're trying to get into peer groups, right? So it's kind of hard to say, cheat your way into a peer group as like having, say, a journal, like being a fake journalist, because the whole goal is to be with journalists because you want to share that activity. If you, like, I don't know, publish something in a high school journal and say, like, deal with a legitimate article, I think that's only hurting yourself instead of really getting the most out of being an anchor. So, um, how do you know if you like, I guess completed a project or like who determines whether the project meets those requirements and how that requirements are well. well, in our previous presentation, we had the Pangea system, which was kind of a broad, all catching name for some sort of electronic uh, dashboard slash database. And so maybe incorporating some sort of algorithms that allows people within the inquiry group to see, okay, X people are applying to the inquiry group and they, they can check their portfolio and say, oh, they've done this. They publish in that journal, and we know that's a legit journal. So people within the groups can welcome people in. If it's possible to incorporate algorithms, like at, say the competency group, you could have test testable competencies. That could be part of the algorithm, and mm -hmm. so that could be also related to the other thing, as I mentioned, is like that's also part of why I think we have this intro to project-based learning course. So part of the hope is that when you form your inquiry group, you are going to uh, decide on what the deliverable deliverables are and what the end goal of the project is. Um, and you know that'll almost be documented, so you should be reaching that. And of course, that may change throughout the course of the project, but you'll also document that and justify why the end goal changed and how you achieve that. Yeah. Well, a question, is there, um, I guess, a higher authority or someone who's holding you accountable to the deliverables of each group? I think that's why we have professors very heavily involved. Yes. So you were sort of getting towards this, but how exactly are projects evaluated? And by whom? And like how is that evaluation stored so that external stakeholders like your future employer can see those values? I think originally we were thinking about some sort of numerical rubric, but then in our last meeting I said that numbers seem too similar to the current system. We think that you could perhaps have a very general evaluation that might be, you know, like gold standard, silver standard, but that that might not even be necessary since the, book, the projects themselves might stand on their own terms. So that the evaluator kind of like look at that essay and like, okay, this is a really good essay, I like this kind of way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I, that's something that we need to research into a little more. Uh, what Anne told us from our meeting was when she looks at the portfolios that come out of our architecture students, she knows that this portfolio is good for this school or this portfolio is good for this school. Um, and so this may actually take some outreach on behalf of our university and potential employers to see what employers we want to see in the portfolio, almost so that you don't need to have a numeric evaluate, um, evaluation of any sort. Uh, but they'd be able to see based off of what you've done and what your portfolio looks like, are you a good fit? Uh, but we need to do some research on that too. And there might be aware that you have too many projects as far as you have to sit through them, so you might just have a showcase that you'll highlight the best projects in the show. Yes. Um, I really like this. I have a lot of questions, six, uh, but I can't go outside of this. I haven't been part of the discussion. So my big question is that for me, a lot of education, when it unlocks things in here, say as opposed to on the world, it's less like putting in Starbucks and Google Maps and finding the way there, as it is kind of stumbling around my neighborhood until I find that one cafe on the road. So my question is, you mentioned it's easier for students to make class about things they like. You only have to, you only learn what you need to know. And so, where or is there a place to get a jolt of something you never thought of before? 
for example, do you read Plato in this? Does it matter? Does that, I, is, how do you get that, that job that you might never consider? I think there's also a question, how do you move, move letters? Um, yeah, so I think part of that you may be taking for granted, um, but part of it we're hoping happens because you are having so much more personal interaction with groups than you've ever had before in universities. I think it goes, but you, I'm sorry, but, but, you, but you tempered that at the end. You begin by saying we should work in groups, and at the end you say only with one other person. Yes, I mean, that's also something we haven't said in study we don't know yet. Um, but it goes back to this idea of what we read near the beginning of the semester about the adjacent possible, where in random conversations you're having, whether it be, you know, because you're working on a project, but you're going to start developing personal relationships with your friends, with faculty, um, and your faculty obviously have worked on far more than anything, you know, more than just this project. Your friends have different interests, your peers have different interests, so there is a hope uh, that you will get that hope of, I don't know, inspiration, uh, but it's never a guarantee. I'm sorry, you're going to say something. Yeah, and so while we're just decentering the class, the class might still be an available option for you to sit in on get those jobs, but they would more be like uh, modules or presentations in the same way like we often have distinguished lecturers or visitors come by. And you can freely choose a model there's class that that's about for inspiration. To build off that point, um, I think I told you the thing about Thank <laughs> you.